Now I'd like to introduce Doug Tallamy, who is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. A man of many talents, Doug is not only an accomplished researcher, but he is also the best-selling author of Nature's Best Hope and also the book, Bringing Nature Home. I was inspired, educated, and informed by Doug when I heard him last fall. I hope you enjoy this presentation. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Doug Tallamy, who will be giving the talk, Restoring the Little Things That Run the World, Why It Matters, and What We Can Do. Good morning, Doug. Good morning, Kathy. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are things I'm, there in Delaware? They're cold and rainy. All right. Well, I'm going to screen share that. now here. Okay. So here we go. Should we buy a larger program for Zoom? All right, it looks good to me. Are we all ready to start? I think you're ready, go ahead. Okay, we do wanna talk about uh, restoring the little things that run the world because they are declining. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna mention that Kathy uh, asked me to uh, make an attempt to westernize my, my talk. Of course, we do our research in the East, all of my slides are from the East. Uh, and just to make it a little bit more relevant to, to folks in California. She sought a number of photographers and sent me a whole bunch of slides, uh, including her own, which I've incorporated in here. Uh, so, so hopefully you'll be seeing some things that you recognize on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you to Barry and Kitty and, and uh, Amy and Sally and Pam and David and Alan and Mark, and then Kathy herself. Okay, we have two choices. We can create landscapes in which nature thrives, such as this or we can create landscapes that are ecologically dead. The first option is gonna sustain us as humans, the second will not. So to restore nature, to create these functional landscapes, we've gotta restore the specialized relationships that are nature. And likewise, if we're going to restore insect populations, we have to restore the specialized relationships that sustain them, such as this one. This is the doll sphinx caterpillar. It's a specialist on uh, Western species of juniper. Not only does it have the physiological ability to eat juniper, which is a pretty toxic plant, uh, it also looks exactly like them, so it can do that without being eaten by birds. Acorn weevils, of course, depend entirely on acorns, and you don't have acorns unless you have your wonderful species of California oaks. Uh, and if you have your California oaks, you often have mistletoe. And if you have mistletoe, you may have this beautiful moth, the beloved Emarginia, which is a specialist on mistletoe. You're not going to have the beautiful Pacific green sphinx moth unless you have evening primrose. You're not going to have 13 species of native bees that specialize on sunflowers. They can only reproduce on the pollen of sunflowers unless you have those sunflowers. You're not going to have pileated, pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants because that's what they rear their young on. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees to produce them. So specialization of these types is, is in the natural world is um, it's the rule, particularly specialization focused on food webs. It's the rule, not the exception, and it always starts with plants. There are lots of animals that depend on the specialized relationships that insects have with plants. So let's point out a few of those. Uh, this is the chestnut back chickadee. Uh, most people think of chickadees as being seed eaters because they're one of the most common birds that our feeders uh, all winter long and of course they are eating seeds but when it comes time to make more chickadees when it comes time to reproduce uh, they can't feed their baby seeds their babies cannot eat seeds so they switch to insects and most of those insects are caterpillars um, we have carolina chickadee here uh, in home i'm, I'm in uh, southwest pennsylvania and we have the carolina chickadee uh, it also uh, is a seed eater during the winter, but during uh, reproduction, it switches to caterpillars. And if it's in a healthy environment, it will feed its young exclusively on caterpillars. Uh, and in fact, most birds in the, the uh, lower 48 states are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. We actually have data to support this. You're looking at 20 families of birds. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet that are caterpillars. And in 16 of the 20 families, uh, caterpillars dominate the nestling diet. So imagine what would happen to, to bird reproduction in those 16 families if caterpillars were to disappear. 
Uh, caterpillars turn out to be essential to most terrestrial food webs. Uh, it turns out that they are transferring more energy from plants uh, to other animals than any other type of, of plant eater. So they're critical insects uh, in our terrestrial ecosystems. And we might want to ask why, what is special about caterpillars? Why do so many things want to eat them? Well, there are a number of reasons. One is that they are, uh, most of are, are relatively soft. So if you think of this, this caterpillar as a little sausage with a thin wrapper, the thin wrapper is its exoskeleton which is not digestible. So birds don't want a lot of exoskeleton. And then it's packed with lots of, of good things to eat. And because it's soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird feed their, their young, that's what they do. They're pretty rough. It's like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Uh, so they're soft, but they're also relatively large. One medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious, they're very high in protein, very high in fat. They have a very low percentage of chitin, of exoskeleton, compared to things like beetles, which are not like sausages, they're like little tanks. Uh, lots of exoskeleton that's not digestible, and they have a lot of pointy edges too. And it turns out that uh, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I, I love organic chemistry, but because I am a vertebrate. You are vertebrates, I presume. Uh, and vertebrates don't make carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. Yet they are essential component of vertebrate diets. So we need carotenoids, the birds need carotenoids, and we have to get them from plants. Uh, and that's why my wife Cindy says I, I should eat my carrots to get my beta carotene and my tomatoes to get my, my lycopene my whatever that is to get my lutein. She makes sure I get all of those things because uh, they stimulate my immune system. I am generally healthier when I have access to lots of, of carotenoids. They're antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. We're talking about birds here now. This is a prothonotary warbler, male, and he is bright yellow because he's taken carotenoids and made pigments out of them. Uh, he's had access to lots of lutein's, and he puts those pigments in his feathers, and the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Uh, well, chickadees are, are, are birds. They're not making their own carotenoids, so they have to get them from plants, but again, they're not they're not eating plants during reproduction, so they have to get them indirectly from plants by eating something that did eat plants. And if we look at the carotenoid content of typical bird prey items, we see that um, they're not equal. The first two bars here are caterpillars, and they have the most carotenoids by far, followed by uh, orthopterans, things like crickets and grasshoppers. The adult caterpillars, the, the butterflies and moths are way down here because the adults are not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids come from. Then way over here, we've got uh, earthworms. So the early bird gets the worm, but he does not get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does this matter? Well, uh, it, it, it does, according to work done by my uh, PhD student, Ashley Kennedy, who put GoPro cameras on the tops of, of bluebird boxes. She had a lot of bluebird boxes and a lot of GoPro cameras, and they took a, a picture once every second. So she actually had to go through more than a million pictures to get the, the data here. Uh, but there's a direct correlation between the frequency with which a prey item is brought back to the nest and the amount of carotenoids that uh, that prey item has. So caterpillars are brought back more often than anything else, followed by those orthopteroids, and then everybody else is nestled down here. So what this is saying is that um, caterpillars may not be optional parts of bird diets. It's starting to look like they are essential components of bird diets. And that means you're not going to have chickadees if you don't have enough caterpillars. And that's true for so many other types of birds. And that means we need to know how much is enough. How many, how many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of, of birds? Well, again, let's look at chickadees. We've got data for chickadees. Um, I wanted to know what chickadees were, were feeding their young several years ago. So I put a box up in my, my backyard. I set my camera up so I could take pictures of what uh, those chickadees were, were feeding their young. And I found out that uh, it takes a lot of caterpillars to rear chickadees. A pair of chickadees can deliver a caterpillar to the nest once every three minutes. 
I watched them for 27 minutes at one point and they brought in 30 caterpillars. How did they do that? By bringing in more than one caterpillar at a time. And sometimes they brought in a whole bunch. And they're, they're working very hard. They're doing this from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. At, at night. Well, the next question is how many species of caterpillars do chickadees bring back to the nest? And it turns out this is a very important question. Uh, I watched them for three hours. And during that three hours, they brought back 17 species of caterpillars. Now remember, this is in my yard and chickadees only forage about 50 meters from the nest. So they got 17 species of caterpillars in my yard within three hours, within 50 meters of the nest. Why is that important? It's important because if I had one or two species of caterpillars in my yard and it happened to be a bad year for those species, uh, like this year, I'm predicting this is gonna be a tough year for caterpillars because it's been so cold and so rainy here. There wouldn't be nearly enough caterpillars for the chickadees to be able to successfully reproduce. But if I have 17 species of caterpillars or 34 or 134, and this got me curious to, to ask uh, how many species of caterpillars are there in my yard. So I started counting them. I am up to 938 species and I'm still going, get new ones all the time. That means that, that, that some combination of all these species, uh, no matter what the weather is, will create enough food so that chickadees get to reproduce any year, again, regardless of the weather. Um, so this type of diversity, I've got that many caterpillars in my yard because I've got the plants that make those, those caterpillars. This is stability uh, in, in the food web, creating st or stability. This is diversity in the food, creating stability in that food web. You've heard that diversity is, is a good thing. And this is one of the main reasons it is. Uh, it, it means that you, you can have creatures reproducing every year, regardless of the variability around them, it stabilizes ecosystems. There was a guy by the name of Brewer way back in 1961, Richard Brewer, who was working on chickadees. And one of the things he needed to know was how many caterpillars they brought back to the nest every day. Uh, so he watched a whole bunch of nests and it turned out to be between 390 and 570 caterpillars per day, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And they're in the nest for 16 days. Uh, so that is 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. Now at that point, he couldn't count them anymore. They're flying all around, but the parents continue to feed the babies for another 24 days after they leave the nest. So who knows how many thousands of caterpillars are required to make one clutch of chickadees. Uh, is this true for other birds? Absolutely. There's data from a number of birds now. You have Wilson's warblers breeding there in California. Um, a guy by the name of Stewart watched Wilson's warblers for five days. A pair brought in 4,060 caterpillars just in, in five days to the nest. And these are tiny birds, around a third of an ounce. What if I wanted to have a Lewis's woodpecker in my yard? It's nine times heavier than a chickadee. How many caterpillars does that take? Uh, and I don't want just chickadees and, and Wilson's warblers and, and Lewis's woodpeckers. I want uh, a whole community of birds. And if I lived in California, I would want Stellar's jay. I would want spotted towhees, white-breasted and red-breasted nuthatches. I would want fox sparrows, black-headed grosbeaks, downy woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers. I'd want both ruby crown and golden crown kinglets, western bluebirds, the buried thrush, western tanagers, brown creepers. I'm very selfish. I want all of these birds in my yard. I want evening grosbeaks and black phoebes and bush tits and Buick's friends and Oregon juncos, tree swallows, western wood peewees, oak titmice, blue gray gnat catchers. And then I want all the warblers too. I want black-throated gray warblers, orange crown warblers, Townsend's warblers, common yellow throat, yellow warblers. And of course, I want Anna's hummingbird and the other hummingbirds. You might say, wait a minute, hummingbirds don't eat insects, they eat sugar water. And of course they do, but um, first part is wrong, they do eat insects. 80 to 90% of a hummingbird's diet is insects and spiders. And then they go get the sugar water. We only see them getting the sugar water, but you don't make a bird out of, out of sugar water. And that is true for 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America. They are rearing their young on, on insects, not seeds and berries. Uh, and this is news to a lot of people. Most people think that, that birds do eat seeds and berries. That's why we see them in our feeders. And many do after they have reproduced. But when they're reproducing, when they're making more birds, which happens to be a really important time in their life history, they need the protein from insects and other arthropods. So no insects, no BB birds. A bit of a generalization, but not much. 
That means we need to design landscapes that are capable of producing a lot of insects. How do we do that? How do we get the diversity and numbers of insects that we're talking about here? Well, to answer this question, we have to return to specialized relationships. We have to consider the most common type of specialized relationship that, it, that happens all over the, the planet. And that is the one between the insects that eat plants and the plants themselves. Plants don't wanna be eaten. They wanna capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their tissues with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those, those tissues either, either bitter or downright toxic. And it's an extremely effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there are no insects that, that uh, uh, wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. And if you don't believe me, when you go outside, uh, first leaf you see, eat it. See if you like it. You're not gonna like it. You're not gonna like it. But we do know that, that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they eat all those toxic plants? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists, which means uh, over evolutionary time, they develop a very tight relationship with a particular lineage of plants. They get good at, at circumventing that lineage of plants defenses. They uh, build the enzymes that detoxify and store and excrete the, the nasty compounds, the behavioral adaptations and the life history adaptations that allow them to reduce their exposure to uh, all the, the plant defenses. But again, it takes a long period of evolutionary exposure before all of those, those adaptations fall into place. It does not happen overnight. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example, because many of you uh, know at least part of the story of specialization in the monarch. Uh, you probably know that, that uh, monarchs are specialists on, on milkweeds, and you may know that milkweeds are toxic plants. So when you're outside eating, eating plants, don't eat a milkweed. They're filled with cardiac glycosides, and if you eat enough of it, it will stop your heart. That's what, that's what cardiac glycosides do. Well, it doesn't stop the monarch's heart, and they do have a heart, by the way, because they've got the, the enzymes that detoxify those, those cardiac glycosides. But what about the sticky latex sap that gives milkweeds its common name? When you break open a milkweed leaf, all this white goo comes out. Uh, if you get it on your finger, you typically wipe it off right away. Uh, but if you don't wipe it off, if you let it sit there for a few minutes, it starts to gel. When it's exposed to oxygen, it turns into a chewing gum-like like substance. Uh, and if that gets on the, the mandibles of a caterpillar, it will glue its mouth shut. And then the caterpillar starves to death. So it's an effective defense. Well, this of course is a caterpillar that eats milkweeds. That's the monarch caterpillar. How does it eat milkweeds without gluing its, its mouth part shut? This is something you can watch in your yard if you have, have milkweeds. The caterpillar will walk onto a new leaf, typically goes to the end of the leaf and it starts to eat. And if it encounters any latex sap at all, it'll stop eating immediately, turn around, crawl back up that leaf, maybe two thirds of the way, and it starts to chew through the midrib. And it chews and it chews till it has completely severed the midrib. And what it's done is block the flow of latex sap from this end of the leaf to this end of the leaf. So now all of this part of the leaf, the distal part of the leaf is latex free. Now the caterpillar can turn around, go back down to the end of the leaf, and it can eat without any latex sap coming out at all. It's a very simple behavioral adaptation uh, that um, it diffuses that effective uh, defense of milkweeds. It also flags milkweed leaves. So if you're a monarch hunter, you can drive down the road, look at a milkweed patch. If you see flag leaves like this, you know that monarchs have been around. Well, those are the upsides of specialization for the monarch. It gets to eat a plant that is unavailable to most other insects because they don't have the specialized adaptations to get around milkweed defenses. There is a downside to specialization though, and it is that now anything it specializes on on a particular plant ends up only being able to eat that particular plant. Now, monarchs can only eat milkweeds. And that is fine as long as there are a lot of milkweeds around, but if we take them away, it doesn't work for the monarch. We have 2,137 plant genera in North America and monarchs can only eat one, the genus Asclepius. Uh, and because we have lost so many of our milkweeds, uh, both uh, on both sides of the Rocky Mountains in California, your monarchs are in deep trouble. They've declined 99% since 1976 um, because of development, agriculture, 
drought and fire, you've lost a lot of your milkweeds. So if you want to keep the monarchs around, we've got to plant milkweeds. Okay, we can use this knowledge of, of specialization, host plant specialization, to, to consciously rebuild food webs wherever we want. If we're talking about doing it at home, let's, let's rebuild them in our yards. If we understand what the components of those food webs are. And I'm gonna use the white-eyed vireo as an example. Uh, that's a bird from, from my yard. I'm gonna use it as an example because this is the nest that my wife Cindy found a few years ago. Um, now, in order to reconstruct the food web of the white-eyed vireo, I have to take pictures of the caterpillars that they're bringing back to the babies. If I can identify the caterpillar, we know a lot about what caterpillars eat. Then I will know what plant was necessary to make the food that feeds these babies. Apparently they knew all that, so they built their nest really low and I could set my camera up again and take pictures of what was happening. And this is what was happening. They were bringing back caterpillars like the blinded sphinx moth. It's a specialist on black cherry in my yard. We have a lot of black cherries making blinded sphinx moths, so the babies get to eat. This little guy is the chestnut shizura. It's a specialist, despite its common name, a specialist on native viburnums. At our house, that's viburnum dentatum, arrowwood viburnum. Um, I know it's, we have arrowwood viburnum because we planted it. Our yard was mowed for hay before we moved in and there weren't many plants here. So we put in the viburnums, chestnut shizuras are here and the babies get to eat. This guy with the white stripe is the drab prominent, a specialist on sycamore. Now we did not plant sycamore, uh, but there was a big win maybe two years after we moved in and blew in some sycamore seeds. Uh, so it's been 18 years since then. One landed in my, my cold frame and germinated. I'm not very good at weeding things out. It's now, it's gotta be 80 feet tall at this point. So I don't have a cold frame anymore, but I do have lots of drab prominence and the babies get to eat. So on and on we go. This is the eight spotted forester moth, a specialist on, on native grapes. We have lots of those. The lunate zaley, another specialist on black cherry. This is the spice bush swallowtail. It's a specialist on spice bush and a close relative of sassafras. This is uh, one of the caterpillars that, that um, when it's attacked, it blows up its prothorax and exposes eyes on its, on its back that make it look like a tree snake. It's supposed to scare the bird. It didn't work this time. This is the tufted bird dropping moth, another specialist on black cherries. So black cherries emerging as a really important uh, component of this bird's food web. But these guys are hungry. They need a lot more than that. So let's put some black walnut into the landscape. If we do that, we get the walnut sphinx, the gray edge bomaloka, the black blotch cesura, the bride. These are all specialists on, on black walnut in my yard. Native maples that give us plagodes, inchworms, the green striped maple worm, the maple bantam dagger moth, and of course, many other species. Native elms give us the four horn sphinx, the double tooth prominent, the interrupted dagger moth, and again, many others. Remember, 90% of the insects that, that uh, are required to keep these birds alive will not be in our yards unless we have the plants on which they specialize with, which, with they, which they have co-evolved. So if I want the mustard sallow, I need witch hazel. If I want the hackberry emperor, I need hackberry. If I want coculio asteroides, I need native asters. The Arcidura flower moth and the brown hooded owlet need goldenrod. The hog sphinx, Pandora sphinx, abbot sphinx all need Virginia creeper. Redbud leaf roller needs redbud. The gray furcula needs uh, native willows. The turbulent phosphilla needs greenbrier. And the orange tufted oneida, the yellow vested moth, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, of the red line panapoda, the laffer, and literally hundreds more will not be in our yards if we don't have oaks. Because it turns out oaks are the most powerful plant we can put in our yards to maintain food webs, not just in my yard, not just in your yards, but in 84% of the counties of North America. Uh, why do we want all these insects? Well, we, we talked about birds, they want them, but it turns out insects are critical components of most of the terrestrial food webs that are out there. All spiders need insects or they eat other other spiders that ate insects uh, and I know a lot of people don't like spiders but look who does it is the second most important component of, of bird food webs um, and of course they're valuable predators if we lost our spiders we'd have uh, we'd have a lot more mosquitoes that we don't need 
we have a lot of insect predators that are eating those insect herbivores. So again, if we lose the herbivores, we'd lose the predators and they themselves are valuable components of, of food webs. Uh, if we lost our insects, we'd lose our frogs, we'd lose our toads, we would lose all of the amphibians because they all eat insects. So do our lizards, so do our bats, so do our rodents, excuse me. Why do these, these uh, creatures all want insects? Because they're really good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much uh, protein in insect meat as there is in, in beef. Uh, and insects have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are loaded with, with uh, fats and lipids um, that are high energy compounds. It allows these little guys to grow quickly, reproduce quickly. And if you're a rodent, that's what you wanna do because you're an important component of food webs too. But it's the same reason that larger organisms are eating insects, they're just really good food. This is a skunk, they eat, insects are digging up your yard to get the grubs that are in your yard. Possums eat a lot of insects, raccoons eat a lot of insects, and even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects. Like our friend, the red fox here, 25% of its diet is insects. A full quarter of its diet is, is insects. 23% of a black bear's diet is, is insects. So uh, even the big guys need insects. And even if you don't eat insects, you need insects. This is a sharp shin hawk, it's a bird predator. You might think, well, I can get rid of all the insects in my neighborhood and still have sharp shin hawks. But think about it, if you got rid of the insects in your neighborhood, you would get rid of the birds that this guy's eating. So he needs them indirectly. Same with the garter snakes, not eating insects directly, um, but it's eating the frogs and the toads that, that ate insects. Point is that a world without insects is a world without biological diversity. And, and uh, Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson told us decades ago, that a world without insects is a world without humans. And that makes it uh, and something that's pretty important here. Uh, he wrote this paper, The Little Things that, that Run the World back in 1987, where he predicted if insects were to disappear, lots of nasty things would happen. First of all, most of the flowering plants would go extinct and that would end energy flow through our, our terrestrial food webs uh, which would cause the collapse of the, the food webs that support the animals that we, we know and love. So we would lose our amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot instead of uh, having the rapid turnover of, of uh, nutrients because of the uh, insect decomposers. We would lose those decomposers and be nothing left. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. Well, we ignored uh, Wilson's warnings, and that's why we now have headlines like this. Uh, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, they have to go back and read EO's paper because he outlined it very clearly. It's not good news. Um, insect declines are being reported uh, at least all over the temperate zone. Not much work in the tropics, but uh, again, not good news. Uh, and these headlines are coming one after another. This one, uh, the UN is now predicting we're gonna lose a million species um, possibly in the next 20 years and humans will suffer. You bet, you bet we'll suffer. We can't afford to lose these species. And most of the species again are, are insects. So we have serious insect declines. Um, a lot of people wanna study it more. That's great, but we also have to stop them. We've got to reverse it. We don't need any more research to, uh, to convince us that it's real. And these are some of the causes, misuse and overuse of pesticides. The, you know, the, the omnipresent habitat loss, every time you build a house, you don't have the insects that used to be on that, that uh, property anymore. Uh, the profligate use of, of non-native ornamental plants, plants from someplace else that don't allow those specialized relationships to develop. Uh, they often escape into our natural areas and become invasive species. We've got problems with security lights at night. We've got roadside mortality. And of course we have climate change. There are, there's good news here. And that is the first, what are there, six causes here? The first six causes are easily addressed. Each one of us can address each one of these causes. And I'll tell you how. Climate change is a little bit tougher. If I asked you to solve climate change uh, yourself, you wouldn't be able to do it. You could stop driving your SUV and yes, it would help, but you'd see no measurable dif distance, difference. Um, you can address the problem up here and see measurable differences. And we'll talk about how to do that. What's happening to insectivores, the things that eat those insects? 
Well, let's again look at the birds. Birds are now our charismatic megafauna. A lot of people uh, like birds. And of course, the news is not good. Another headline we just had a few months ago, we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 45 years. Let me remember, remind you what a, a billion is. A million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 31.7 years. So a billion is a big figure. We now have 3 billion fewer breeding birds in North America. 432 species of North American birds now considered at risk of extinction. Not because there's only five left of each one. Many of these are common birds, but because their population trajectories are heading down so rapidly. That's the, the signal for impending extinction at this point. So again, not, not good news. I think that our only viable option is, is to learn how to live in ecological harmony with the natural world that sustains us. To learn how to live sustainably with a natural world that, that sustains us. So let's look at some of the problems we have. One is, um, you know, we, we have parks and we have preserves. You certainly have some wonderful ones in, in California. Why can't they preserve the biodiversity that we need? It's a good question. Uh, and the answer is, they're too small and they're too isolated from each other. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little, little habitat fragment and through most of the country, this is what we have. Doesn't have to be this small, but you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And that's the big problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Uh, well, when you have a large population, the top line here, all populations fluctuate. In good times they go up, bad times they go down. But if you're a large population, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals that you can increase quickly when times get better. But small populations in their normal fluctuations often hit zero. They blink out of their little habitat patch uh, and then they're gone. Unless they recolonize, that becomes local extinction. Uh, and picture, picture uh, a box turtle, for example, crossing uh, a major highway. It doesn't happen anymore. So local extinction is what we need to worry about. A lot of people only worry about global extinction. Um, I don't care if box turtles are doing fine in, in uh, the Great Smoky Mountains at this, this point. We need species to run the ecosystems where we are everywhere because the number of species in an ecosystem determines how well it functions. And we need highly functioning ecosystems everywhere because we need to produce ecosystem services everywhere because we have so many humans everywhere, not just in our parks and our preserves. David Quammen has an excellent analogy between a Persian rug and ecosystems. This is a Persian rug, a functional Persian rug. This is not 71 Persian rugs. It's 71 fragments that are not functioning as a Persian rug. Uh, and this is pretty much what we've done to our, our ecosystems. So there's data from all over the, all over the world and some of the studies are quite, quite long, over a hundred years uh, in length at this point, but they're all telling us the same thing. We have not left uh, enough nature out there to sustain the species that run our, our ecosystems. Not only that, so we're just doing a little bit of bad news here. The viable habitats we have left uh, are, are fragmented, but they are also invaded with what we call invasive species. Let's just talk about invasive plants. Now you people in California know about invasive plants. Uh, people everywhere know about invasive plants. They are every place. This is one of those little habitat fragments near where, where I live called White Clay Creek State Park. And every bit of green you're seeing there is a plant from Asia. I took this picture in March before our deciduous plants leaf out. The plants from Asia leaf out first. So it's a very good time to see what your, your alien plant load is. And it's about a third of the, of the vegetation in um, parks most places are unable to support the insects that run our ecosystems because they are plants from someplace else and our insects have not adapted to them. How do we know this? Well, that's, that's what we've been studying in my lab at the University of Delaware for, I don't know, 13, 14 years now. Um, we can measure it. We can measure what happens to local food webs when we take away the native plant communities that used to support them and replace them with plants from outside of those communities. Here's one simple study that was recently published. We simply went into hedgerows in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and, and Delaware. 
uh, that were invaded by non-native plants. So here you see a lot of autumn olive and a lot of porcelain berry and multiflora rose and the other things we have here. And compared the caterpillar communities in those hedgerows with caterpillar communities in hedgerows that were not invaded, that were mostly native plants. We found a 68% reduction in the number of species in those invaded hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of the caterpillars in those hedgerows, and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the amount of energy flowing through that, that food web in the invaded habitats. So if you think of, of, of caterpillars as bird food, you got a 96% reduction in the amount of bird food uh, in areas where these non-native plants have, have invaded. Does this matter? Well, it matters if you're this common yellow throat trying to feed your young. Um, some people have said, well, you know, he can, he can just forage 96% uh, harder to get the same amount of food, but he can't. He's already foraging all day long, 156 trips a day. He can't do that 96% harder. So the prediction is you'll have 96% uh, less bird biomass in a habitat that's been invaded by these, these plants. And that's, that's reflecting very much those terrible figures we just talked about. Trying to, trying to personalize this a little bit. What if I said, introduced plants have reduced your bank account by 96%. I think you would get it right away that uh, this is not good. This is not good. Well, insects are the currency in our ecological bank account, and we have to start thinking seriously about getting those populations back up. Um, I want you to, to think about it from the perspective of the birds that uh, require these insects. So think of yourself as this magnolia warbler. You're now this magnolia warbler. You have just finished overwintering in the uh, Talamica Mountains of Costa Rica. It is time for you to fly north to reproduce and you're about to undergo the most dangerous thing you're ever gonna do, migration. Predation risks are high, the energy expenditure is, is fantastic. Um, migrants lose 35% of their, of their body weight on long flights like crossing the Gulf of Mexico, uh, but any long flight they, they do. Um, and when they stop, they have to put that weight back up. People are looking at the stomach contents of tiger sharks in the Gulf of Mexico and during migration, they're filled with migrating birds that just don't make it. They come down right in the middle of the ocean. So migration is hard. Uh, and you might ask the question, uh, the legitimate question, if it's so hard, why did it evolve in, in birds? Why would they bother to do it? Why don't they stay where they are? Well, migration evolved for the same reasons that anything evolves. The, the benefits of migration outweighed the costs. The costs are high, but the benefits are even higher. What are those benefits? Uh, well, in the temperate zone in North America, in the spring, we have this, this giant flush of new leaves. And following that giant flush of new leaves is a giant flush of the insects that eat those, those leaves. So you have this big flush of, of food that enables insect, uh, birds that come up and take advantage of that to actually make more babies. That does not happen in the tropics. The tropics are much more steady. It's a lot of competition for food in the, in the tropics. So if you take advantage of this, this spring bonanza of food in the temperate zone, instead of rearing two to four offspring per year, you can rear three to six offspring per year. It doesn't seem like a big difference, but it's enough to balance the costs of uh, uh, migration. So let me emphasize this, bird migration was only adaptive because there were so many insects that were seasonally available in the temperate zone. This study came out uh, 2018, talking about, I don't know how they, they measured it, but uh, they claimed that birds eat 500 million tons of insects each year. And they presented it as if, um, well, this is great because birds are eating 500 million tons of pests each year. Uh, believe me, insects are, are not all, all pests. Let's rewrite it and just say birds require 500 million tons of insects each year. And if you take away that tonnage of insects, you're going to take away the birds. So these types of insect declines are not just affecting a few obscure migrating birds. It's, it's most of the birds that we, we know and love. There are 386 species of neotropical migrants that may no longer have enough insects to justify that migration. It's our swallows and our swifts, our orioles, our hummingbirds, our vireos and tanagers, our buntings, our flycatchers and thrushes, our warblers, and we have a lot of species of warblers, our, our bobolinks, our nightjars, 
all of these, these birds are at risk because uh, the reason they're coming north is to get all the insects and we don't have those insects there anymore. So which plants should we be sure to have in our landscapes? Um, the plants that are gonna make the most insects and there's two ways of finding out what those plants are. Uh, we helped create a, a um, tool that is now launched on the Native Plant on the uh, National Wildlife Federation website called Native Plant Finder. You go to this uh, tool, put in your zip code and uh, the ranked list of um, woody and herbaceous plants for your county will pop up. So the excuse, I don't know what to plant uh, to, to help uh, wildlife in my yard is no longer a good excuse. You can find out what it is. And this works really well in most parts of the country, except in California for two reasons. You've got, you've got a number of biomes in California. You've got these mountains right in the middle that, that depends on which side of the mountain you're on. And your counties are huge. So you, there's no one um, plant that's gonna work in all places in a county. So luckily the, the um, uh, California Native Plant Society created Calscape, and you're going to get a little little workshop on how to do Calscape at the end here, which is it's an excellent tool. I wish every uh, state had a had a Calscape. Um, they've got GPS coordinates for where every single plant, native plant in in the state is located. So you can look at those maps and very quickly identify the plants that are appropriate for exactly where you live. Very powerful tool. But when we made these tools, um, a very um, striking pattern jumped out at us. Uh, and that was that it's actually a very few species of native plants are making most of the food. About 5% of our native plants are making about 75% of the food that drives these, these food webs. So I started calling those keystone plants. Uh, and, and what it means is that all natives are not created equal. Some are really good, some are, are okay, and some aren't making a whole lot of food at, at all. So the question is no longer are natives better than non-natives. On average, they certainly are. But the question really should be, do I want an ecologically powerful plant in my, my yard? Um, or do I want a benign one that's not going to contribute anything? Or even worse, uh, an unproductive plant that's going to escape and invade local habitats. I get emails a couple times a year from people saying, don't I know that, that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago? So that makes them native and that's why we can plant them. Well, if being native was our only criterion, um, well, I'd still argue with that, but uh, that's, not our, that's not our metric anymore. Our metric is how many caterpillars is it making? Ginkgos make zero. So I don't care if it grew on the moon 7 million years ago, it is not a productive plant in North American landscapes now. Uh, it's good for other reasons, but if you want to help wildlife, ginkgo is not going to do it compared to your oaks, 270 species of caterpillars produced by California oaks, which are you gonna plant if you wanna help your, your local birds. Um, eucalyptus, Californians love your eucalyptus, only support five species of, of uh, native caterpillars. Compared to your local prunus, 246 species of, of caterpillars. These are your, your cherries like holly leaf cherry. Your zelkova, no caterpillars compared to uh, Ceanothus like, like uh, California lilac, 93 species of caterpillars supported by, by that. Um, Mike, uh, Kathy's husband made this very handy uh, graph, which might be a little hard for you to read. So we're gonna, we're gonna dwell on this a bit at the end of the talk, but the green bars are some of the native ornamentals that can be used in California landscapes. And the red ones are typical ornamentals um, that are non-native. And this is the number of, of caterpillar species that they support. Uh, so look, here's the, here's the difference between um, regular species and those keystone species. Look at how big the, the oaks and the cherries are compared to everything else. But look how big all the green bars are compared to the red bars. These guys are not going to support life in our, our ecosystems. So think of your yard, um, your plants in your yard as if they were bird feeders, because they, they can be if you pick the right plants. So there you go, they're bird feeders. Now you get to decide how well you're going to feed the birds. You can feed them a lot or you can feed them just a little bit. This is what the landscapes around me look like, giant lawns with very few plants in them. You can choose the plants that actually make the caterpillars. You can have food in your bird feeders, in other words, or you can have plants where the bird feeders are empty. There's the ginkgo back there. No caterpillars. It's a big tree, but it's just not contributing. Uh, and, and when we don't think about the role of these keystone uh, species or genera in our, our landscapes, we're not fooling 
the birds. I'm going to share a little bit of data from my, my PhD student, Desiree Narango. She's not my student anymore. She's graduated, but she looked at, at Carolina chickadee reproduction in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Uh, as a function of the landscape plants around where the nest box was. Um, she, she got to compare when most of the landscape plants were native and most of the landscape plants were non-native and compared chickadee breeding success. So this is a typical uh, breeding territory of a pair of chickadees. The star is where the nest is. Uh, again, it's about 50, 50 meters from the, from the nest is, is where they're foraging. The blue areas are the trees on which they did 95% of their, their foraging. So let's look at what, what those species are. Um, you may not recognize them, but these are all native species in the DC area. Basswood and sweet gum and American elm, black cherry, two species of oaks. Let's also look at the plants that the birds did not forage on. And they're all the plants from Asia. We've got Japanese maples and silk tree. Here's our friend, the ginkgo, black poplar, crepe myrtles, saucer magnolia. And it's very easy to picture a landscape where these are the dominant plants. So that allowed uh, Desiree to compare chickadee reproductive success in those two types of landscapes. And when they were dominated by non-native plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you've reduced the amount of food for the chickadees by 75%. Um, those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So even though there's a nest box up and nest box, uh, you know, chickadees are tree hole breeders that's always in short supply, the birds would come, they'd look at the landscape and say, there's simply not enough food here. We're not even gonna bother. If they did bother, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those nests were 29% less likely to survive at all. They produced 1.2 fewer fledglings. It took them 1.5 days longer to do it. And the chicks that left the nest were lighter than the ones that were in more native habitats. And you might say, well, these aren't, aren't huge differences. But when you put all that together in a population growth model, this is what you get. As a percentage of the non-native plants in the landscape, from 0% to 100%, this is the dotted, this dotted line represent replacement rate. The population uh, at this dotted line is reproducing as many chicks, as many offspring as adults that are dying. So it's a sustainable population that's not growing, but it's not shrinking. Anything above that dotted line is a growing population, but anything below it is a shrinking population. Uh, and right here is where they overlap around 30% non-native plants. So if you have a landscape where 70% of the plant biomass is uh, our productive native plants, you can have uh, a sustainable breeding bird population. What I, so, so that's good. This is the first time this has been measured for, for any bird anywhere, but it also suggests that there's, there's room for compromise. 30% of your landscape can be uh, non-native plants that aren't contributing much, as long as they're not invasive. Um, they're not going to destroy your, your ecosystem. Uh, and this is good news. If I told people that you weren't allowed to have any non-native ornamental plants, um, I'd have very few people listening to me. But you can as long as you get those big dominant um, productive keystone plants in your landscape. Desiree also looked at the number of, of migrating birds that passed through her study sites in, in Washington, DC. It was 51 species. And remember, migrants fly all night long. They do not fly around our cities. They fly right through them. Uh, and, and when it comes dawn, around four in the morning, they come down. And what they have to do, everybody says they've got to rest. But what they really have to do is gas up. They've got to re, excuse me, refuel by eating the insects that are going to put that body weight back on. And if they come down in the land of ginkgo, there's nothing to eat. And that's the end of the migration. That's the end of the bird. Uh, so a lot of people say, well, I don't, I don't own a property that's big enough to support uh, a breeding bird. And that may be true. But if you own a property big enough to support a single plant that makes caterpillars, you can support migrating birds. And believe me, they will, they will appreciate it if you do that. They will stop. They will eat those, those, uh, those caterpillars. So what we're talking about here really is, is nothing less than rebuilding the Earth's carrying capacity, its ability to support life. We humans have steadily uh, eroded the carrying capacity by taking plants away. So what we have to do is put them back. Where are we going to do that? Uh, we have to do it as many places as we can, but we can't avoid 
privately owned property. 78% of the entire use, uh, U.S. is privately owned. 86% east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignored uh, the places where we live and work and, and, and play, conservation would not work because it would be confined to, you know, at, at best 15% of, of the U.S. And again, those sites would be too small and too isolated uh, for, for it to sustain the species we wanted to sustain. So on these, these private properties, we have to restore nature's relationships. We have to raise the bar about what we've asked our landscapes to do. Um, so in the past, we've asked them to be pretty. That's good. We could keep doing that. But now they also have to support viable food webs. They have to support life. And they're going to do that by putting the right plants back. They have to sequester carbon. Everybody needs to be sequestering carbon now. And it's plants that do that. I had a student a few years ago that said, we need to invent a machine that pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and, and uh, locks it up and then pumps it into the ground. I said, well, that, that would be nice, except we already have that machine. It's called a tree. And if we put the trees back, they're pumping carbon or, or a lot of our herbaceous plants too are pumping carbon into the soil uh, as long as they live. We also have to clean and manage our watersheds. Everybody lives in a watershed, everybody. And nobody has the ethical right to destroy that watershed. You manage it by putting the plants back. We have to enrich our soil primarily with carbon, pump that carbon back in, and we've got to support pollinators. Supporting pollinators uh, has been politically correct for a while. Uh, and the argument is, well, we have to support them for agriculture. That's not why we have to support pollinators. Um, they say, well, they support, they, they, they pollinate a third of our, our crops. They pollinate 80 percent of all plants and 90 percent of all flowering plants. If we were to lose our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90 percent of the plants on the planet. That is not an option. It is simply not an option. Far more important than, than a few of our fruit trees. So we're not talking about, about good land stewardship here. We're talking about essential land stewardship. Roy Dennis is a land manager in England who recently said that land ownership is more than a privilege. It's a responsibility, and I couldn't agree with that more. What he's talking about here is the biosphere of the planet, that very thin film of, of life on the surface of the planet. If the planet was an egg, the biosphere would be thinner than the eggshell. Yet that is where all the life that we know about uh, exists, uh, and, and, and who knows? Maybe it's all the life in the universe, and it's certainly all the life that we're ever going to interact with in the universe, right there on the biosphere. But we have chopped up that biosphere into private land ownership. So Tom owns this, Dick owns this, Mary owns this. Harry, don't forget Harry, he owns something too. Um, okay, but along with that, that private land ownership comes the responsibility of stewarding all the life in the universe. I can't think of a more awesome responsibility than that. This is a, a church I drove by in Mississippi not long ago and everybody's inside worshiping God's creations and on the outside they're killing them all with this giant dead lawn. We're not thinking. We're just not thinking. So in the past, we've gone to the nursery. We look for plants uh, simply for aesthetical reason. We thought plants were just decorations. So we buy something that's pretty, and and then we're we're happy. Uh, but when we landscape with plants uh, just as decorations, um, it ends up being pretty. It is. But then landscaping equals ecological destruction. We could pick pretty plants that produce ecosystem services, that support our food webs, protect our watershed, that uh, create pollinator habits, support natural, natural uh, enemies. Uh, and if we make function uh, part, one of the criteria that we use when we choose landscape plants, then landscaping equals ecological restoration. And I'm going to call this 21st century landscaping. We've done 20th century landscaping, and we're now in the sixth grade extinction. So I'm, I'm not impressed with it. Let's give this a try. All right, here are nine things that you can do to restore the insect populations and thus the ecosystems in your, in your yard. Um, let's start with the first one, cut your lawn in half. Now I know a lot of people in California don't have, have giant lawns, but it's something to think about anyway, uh, because we got a lot of lawn. Got a lot of lawn in North America. We have an area the size of New England that is in, in lawn. It's over 40 million acres and it is a dead zone. And the stuff we put on our lawn and, the, and the, all the mowers that we cut them with um, are poisoning our, our environments and our, our watershed. So let's think about cutting that area in half and putting those keystone plants in the area we take out of, of lawn. 
We also want to think about planting for specialist bees. Now, I didn't get a chance to talk about bees uh, in this talk. It's just too long. But bees, of course, critical. We need them to pollinate plants everywhere. Uh, and there are a lot of bees that are, are specialist, meaning they will only reproduce on the pollen of particular plant genera. Um, so in a lot of areas of the country, there are about 13 species of bees that only use sunflower pollen, 12 species that only use aster pollen, 11 species that only use goldenrods, and so on. So if you have sunflowers, asters, goldenrod, evening primrose, willows in your yard, you're supporting uh, more than 50 species of, of bees. Uh, if you don't have those, you've just lost 50 species of bees. The generalist bees will follow these plants. They can use these plants as well, but you lose the specialists when you don't uh, pay attention to these relationships. Uh, remove invasive species from your property. This is a no brainer and don't go to the nursery and buy new invasive species. By the way, let's be clear about what an invasive species is. I hear a lot of people talking about native plants being invasive. That the definition of an invasive plant is a non-native that's displacing native plant communities. There are natives that can be aggressive, but that's not what invasive means. Uh, so if you have a non-native that can easily escape your yard and penetrate your natural areas, remove it and put in one that is not invasive. Okay, use those keystone plants. Uh, we talked about that. We want to use those top performing plants. They don't have to be the only plants we use. But um, if we don't use them, it's, it's like uh, building your house without the two by fours. It's the, those are the plants that are holding up the relationships in your landscape. You can then decorate around, but you, you know, we don't build our houses out of, of wallpaper and we can't build landscapes without keystone plants. Preserve your leaf litter. What am I talking about? And your ground covers. Uh, again, where I live, Pennsylvania, there are 511 species of caterpillars that develop on oaks in Pennsylvania. A few of them complete their development on the oak tree. Uh, this is the polyphemus moth that spins, its, the caterpillar eats the, the uh, leaves and then it spins its cocoon. Um, and then it emerges as an adult and does everything on the tree. And I wish all of, of uh, the oak beaters did that, but they don't. 94% of them, 480 species drop from the tree and pupate in the soil. They tunnel it underneath the soil and form their, their pupa, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree. And that's where the problem comes in because we don't leave leaf litter under our tree. And we, we compact our, come back here. We compact our soil and mow it. Uh, so this becomes a, a no man's land for any caterpillar that's trying to complete its development. So these might all be oaks or really high producing trees, but it becomes an ecological trap. You're calling in the moths to lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, and then they, then they die. Uh, and of course, the cement landscape is an even worse alternative. I'm not trying to discourage trees in, in trees, but I would like to see less cement. This is just uh, laziness in terms of, of landscaping and it destroys our watersheds. This is the typical scenario. We have trees growing in the middle of a lawn um, and I would like to measure, nobody's measured caterpillar survivorship when they drop out of the trees in a situation like that. I'd like to try to do that this summer if we can, um, but I can guarantee, and this, this of course <laughs> is that compact soil and no plants here at all. Um, very tough on a caterpillar. This is what we're going for. We want the tree, but then we want a layered landscape underneath it. We want our, our, our native, uh, this is a native azalea here and, and our ferns and, you know, biome specific, but you want plants under those trees uh, that are going to be over ground that is undisturbed. You're not going to go walking through this spring ephemeral garden. You're not going to trample it. You're not going to mow it. And the caterpillars that fall down in here will be able to complete their development without any problem. It's a great place for ground covers um, like your yerba buena, um, good ground cover in, in uh, California. Caterpillars drop into here and it's a safe zone. Okay, night lights are killing our insects by the billions. So, uh, we need to address this. And this is probably the easiest thing to address. We light up the skies at night. Uh, and, and the excuse is always for security. Uh, I think it's just a habit. Um, if you're really worried about security, put a motion sensor on your security light so that it only turns on when the bad man comes. And you would be surprised how often the bad man does not come. Um, even better, put a yellow light yellow light bulb in your, your uh, security light. 
uh, or a yellow LED bulb is the best. It's the least uh, attractive to insects. So overnight, if we replaced all of our nightlights with yellow LED bulbs, we could we could um, save billions of insects almost almost instantly. Opposed mosquito spraying. Um, you know, we're fogging for mosquitoes all over the country, uh, and we're doing it. Uh, really for no good reason. Mosquitoes do transmit diseases, but we don't have most of those in this country. We don't have any Zika virus now. Uh, this is Mosquito Joe, and he will tell you where these, these fogs are only killing mosquitoes. Not so. This is pyrethroids. It's killing all the insects it attracts. So, you know, we're trying to build insects in our landscape, and Mosquito Joe comes and, and kills them all. And it doesn't just stay where he's spraying. It floats over to the neighbors and kills them as well. And he says, well, it's organic. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's totally safe. Organic meaning it comes from a plant, and it does. Uh, but cyanide comes from a plant, too. That does not make it safe. Uh, if you really have a mosquito problem, and I don't know how big your mosquito problems are in, in California, but this is how you can control them. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in some straw or hay and let it ferment for a day or so, and it becomes irresistible to ovipositing mosquitoes. They lay their eggs in there. When the larvae hatch, you put in a mosquito dunk that you get at the, the drugstore, hardware store. Put it in, the mosquito larvae eat it. This has got Bacillus thuringiensis in it. It's a, a, a mosquito-specific um, bacterium that kills mosquitoes, only mosquitoes. Uh, so you're not hitting any non-targets. It's very effective. It's not very expensive. And if everybody had mosquito dunk traps out there, we'd have far fewer mosquitoes. Minimize insecticide use overall. You realize homeowners use more insecticide per acre than, than agriculture. Um, so, and, and most of it is, is absolutely unnecessary. It's, you know, we've got this thing, we've got to kill all insects, but we're not actually sure why. We don't, we don't. Then finally, there are a lot of rules out there from your homeowners association or your township saying, well, you have to have dead landscapes because we say so. Join your HOA, change from within, um, you know, penetrate them, infiltrate them. Uh, these rules were made by people who didn't understand the ecological relationships around them. We can change those rules. Well, there's nothing sacred about them. So I'm going to uh, end this part of the talk by uh, talking about um, a book that E.O. Wilson wrote in 2016 called Half Earth. I don't know if any of you read it, but he's making the argument that if we're going to save life on Earth anywhere, we have to save it on half. We have to have ecosystem function on half of planet Earth. Uh, and he spends most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement, and then he ends the book. Well, this is a wonderful thing. I'd love to see it happen, but we we're scratching our heads saying, well, how, how can this be possible? Remember, agriculture is already in half of terrestrial planet Earth, and we're stuck in the other half. All 8 billion of us with all of our infrastructure and our airports and our roads and everything else. How can we have, have functioning ecosystems where we have all of those humans? Well, I actually think we can do it. We can do it uh, by, by uh, enacting the things I just talked about. We can realize EO's dream but we need a new approach to conservation. We've had this idea that humans and nature cannot coexist. That's nonsense. Of course we can coexist. As a matter of fact, I think coexisting is now our only option. This is what we have to do. We have to have functioning natural relationships where humans abound. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance, as if not all places have ecological significance. Another crazy thing, every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including your yard. We can't leave conservation to the conservationists anymore. There's way too much conservation that has to be done and not nearly enough conservationists. So we all have to participate. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you, where you live. Or if you're ambitious, you can save it where you work as, as well. I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. And this is a time in our, our uh, human existence where we want to be empowered. There are a lot of, of giant environmental problems out there and most of us feel helpless. But this is one where you, you can plant that, that oak, you can plant that native plant and watch the life come to it, um, make a difference either in property you own or, or volunteer in a, in a nearby um, park or preserve. It also shrinks the problem to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the Earth's giant problems. Just worry about your own property, your own little park. 
do something, get rid of those invasives, cut that lawn in half, put in those keystone plants, and we'll be happy. So as property owners, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. None of us are gonna be able to fix it alone, but we really can fix it if we work together. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm not gonna do questions right now. What I am gonna do is return to this graph, the one that, that Mike made. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, many of these, not, not all of them, and make some, some start comparisons. And when I was in, in San Francisco uh, last year at some point, and I noticed a lot of sweet gums. That's a plant, of course, from the east. Uh, I've got sweet gums right in my yard here. It's not a terribly powerful plant. It supports 37 species in, in my county. But in, in your county, in near San Francisco, it supports one, one introduced species. Um, so you can't call it a native just because it's from North America. It's not from California, not producing a lot of a lot of, uh, of food. So you can use that or you can use that ginkgo we talked about several times and make no caterpillars at all. Or you can put in one of your 39 species of, of oaks. I think California has more species of oaks than any other state. Um, and of course, then you have the option of making 270 species of, of caterpillars. That's the pinnacle of our keystone species. Um, you can you can put your, ecos, your your eucalyptus in or get on one of the committees to save the eucalyptus. They're making five caterpillars. I'd love to, to find one of those because they're sure not very common. Um, or crepe myrtles, beautiful, but make no caterpillars, just a decoration. Or you can put in one of your 15 species of, of native prunus, the native cherries, 246 species of caterpillars, just things like your, your holly leaf cherry, very powerful plants. Um, Tree of heaven, highly invasive in the east here. Uh, that's Alanthus, supports two species of, of, of caterpillars. Could be one of your eight species of, of native maples, Acer, support 85 species. You see the differences here, stark contrast between the natives and the non-natives. You have eight, uh, or I don't know how many species of acacia. You've got a lot of species of acacia. None of them are native to California. Um, it's a legume. Legumes do make a lot of, of nitrogen. So you've got eight species of caterpillars eating them, but it could be a manzanita. You've got 103 species. Of, of types of, of manzanita, support 41 species. There's always a, a um, better alternative than a native. Your English ivy, again, highly invasive, supports six species. I've never sent, found anything on an English ivy, but you've got 69 species of, of ribes that together support 83 species of, of caterpillars just in, in California. Those are the, the currents. And of course, they're very beautiful. That's, that's a good bonus. Catoniester, another common non-native a lot of people use, supports seven species, but it could be a California lilac, one of 100 species of California Ceanothus, um, Ceanothus that supports 79 species of caterpillars, much better alternative. Ocean spray, Holodiscus discolor is a, is a um, pretty, and um, there's only one species, but it supports 24 species of caterpillars. It's a good native. Forget me not, nah, it's very popular, I guess, support three species but it could be a lupine. You got a hundred species of lupines in, in California that support 49 species of, of caterpillars. Fennel, now pollinators, look at these all honeybees, by the way, that's an, that's an introduced uh, native generalist bee. They support four species of, of, of uh, caterpillars, but uh, the native asters, now the asters are broken up into several genera. There are 95 species in California. Um, of aster-like plants that look like this. Nobody's measured the number of caterpillars since they broke up the, the uh, genera, but it is many. Um, it's a top producer back here in the East and I'm sure it is in California as well. Another non-native lily of the, of the Nile. Now you see why we're using them. They're pretty, I agree, they're pretty, but no caterpillars, no caterpillars. It's just a decoration. Could be a, a native goldenrod. You've got 11 species of goldenrods that support um, 27 species of caterpillars. And boy, that seems low to me. Uh, in my yard, it's 110 species. I bet there's more out there in California if we look for them. Periwinkle vinca, another non-native, supports two species, could be a California rose. Um, and you plant them densely enough, you can get a nice nice ground cover. You've got 21 species of, of roses, native roses in California, and they support 70 species of caterpillars. <clears throat> Ice plant, another non-native, zero species of caterpillars. Could be one of your sages, your Artemisia, support 21 species. <clears throat> Point is, with natives, we can create landscapes that are both beautiful and functional. Thanks for listening.
Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Talamy. Yes. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to now, um, before we take questions from Dr. Talamy, I want to show you um, two uh, ways that you can find the best plants with the highest reproductive value for butterflies and moths for your own yard. Before we leave, can I say, that was my garden that we just that saw. Was, that was your garden. <laughs> <laughs> your name was in the corner there. <laughs> I was so pleased to see it in your slideshow. So let's go now to the Garden Tour website. <clears throat> and um, we have put up a quick um, keynote speaker, Douglas Tallamy section here. We'll probably move later, but for the moment, if you're wondering, as I was after I heard uh, Doug speak last fall, uh, what natives will do well in my yard, you can go to this PDF. And um, here we can see, I don't know how many, Dr. Tallamy, how many, how many species do you think you have on this list? A hundred? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, a lot. At least so, at a least hundred. looks like more than that. Up to yeah. the top. And we sorted it by the plants that have the highest reproductive value to butterflies and moths. So you can see if, if we had a wet lot and had willows, we could support 327 species, but oaks are 270. And then what I did when I was doing some replanting in my own yard recently, is I looked down the list and I thought, well, ribes are beautiful and they're medium sized shrug, shrub 122 species. I could put ribes in my yard. Here's a ceanothus. Uh, 117 species. Highlight it. Highlight. Go ahead. Highlight. So I, um, I, I made up a list by um, looking at the at the list that was of interest to me. Okay, so I'm going to back up now. Can I close this? And um, we also have. I made up this list. <clears throat> so this is a kind of a quick a shortcut sheet for those of you. This is a list of easy to grow San Francisco Bay Area, California native plants that are readily available at our local native plant nurseries that have high reproductive values to butterflies and moths. And the number of species on the right here is the number of species and butterflies and moths that will lay eggs on them. So these are beautiful backbone keystone uh, plants that will do well in our Bay Area gardens. And then as a quick comparison, I just took some of the um, plants from Doug's uh, non-native list and I put them down here so you can review those. There's one more list here that you could look at. And uh, Kelly Marshall made up this list. Kelly is a landscape designer. She lives in Clayton and uh, she has a list. We don't have the number of species here, but these are also a high reproductive value to Lepidopterans broken out by trees, shrubs, and perennials, and grasses. So um, now, um, I would like to uh, introduce another terrific resource, and that is Calscape. So um, we'll go over to Anne-Marie Benz, who I think is with us, yes. So Anne-Marie is with Calscape and Calscape is a database that was developed by the California Native Plant Society to help you discover the plants that are best suited to your property. Using Calscape, you can search by location, plant name, water needs, uh, get detailed plant information and more. And Anne-Marie is with us today from the California Native Plant Society to give you, us a quick demonstration of how you can search for the best butterfly plants for your own gardening. Good morning, Henry. Good morning, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Doug, for all of that information. We're going to take a look now at Calscape that had been mentioned earlier. Let me go ahead and go to the Calscape site here for you. So on Calscape, you can get information specific to your exact location, both for your plants and for your butterflies that are available there. I'm going to run through just a couple of different ways we can look for the right plants for your space and for what you're looking to do. The first is on the home page here. You can go in and I'm going to enter an address in Oakland and get an idea of what all plants might be specific to that area. 
you can get the general plants. They'll be broken out by all plants, trees, shrubs, perennials, all the different kinds of ways you may want to look for one, butterfly hosts. You can click on butterfly hosts from there and kind of go down and see the whole variety of plants. Or if you want to get really specific for your location, you can go over to screen share over to our advanced search and you have your address in there and let's say I need partial shade on my location and I need very easy care I know myself I'm not going to do this all that often very well and I want a butterfly garden so I go to that check my parameters and ask it to search and it will give me very specific ones for my location for the different parameters on my site and then I'll give you an idea of the plants and you can click on a plant and the plant and scroll down and it'll tell you about the plant, what type it, how do you care for it, what does it need, landscaping information. Um, but even better for looking for butterflies, you can go to our top here and click on butterflies and you put in your address again. And here are the 365 butterflies and moths that are native to my area. And I can click on what kind of butterfly I might want to know more about and to know what kind of plants they would be looking for. First off, we've got these beautiful pictures of the different kinds. And then you can look at the host plants for that type of butterfly specific to your area. And you can click on the host plants to learn a little bit more about what are the right ones to really plant for your butterfly garden. Here we've got a pearly everlasting. We've got the photos. You can read more about it. You can see how big it's going to get, what type of form you're going to have, how quick it's going to grow. You're going to see when, it's, when and how it's going to flower. It's got a whole variety of butterflies and moths that are interested in it. You can look at what kind of landscape needs it has, um, common uses, deer resistant and butterfly gardens. In my Oakland yard, that's a win. Um, soil types that you'll need. So it's a way to look for how to create the butterfly garden that is appropriate to and specific to your location. And if you need more information, Calscape has a variety of pieces to look at or there's more on the California Native Plant Society website. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. That was terrific. So I know that that went fast and it's a, um, uh, Calscape is a fantastic database. So this program is being recorded. It'll be available online on YouTube. And if you want to come back and look at that a little more slowly later on, uh, you can do that. So now, uh, Doug, let's go back to you. And we have about a um, little more than 15 minutes for some questions and answers. And you said a number of things in your talk that just had such impact on me when I heard you, that um, there are almost 3 billion fewer breeding birds in North America now compared to 45 years ago, that among the handful of causes of this decline were non-native ornamental plants, and that you gave the quote, with property ownership comes the responsibility to choose plants wisely. The days when we could choose a plant just because it is pretty in the garden are over. When we make that choice, we choose ecological destruction. That's something that you wrote in the Chickadee's Guide to Gardening. Native plants, you said, are bird feeders. If we plant natives, we'll have birds, butterflies, and native bees in your gardens. So I've certainly been promoting the use of native plants for many years, but that had such impact on me. It was such a clear connection between why we should be including native in your gar in our garden. So I wanna thank you for that and we'll open it up now. Do you wanna say anything in response to that before we go to questions? Uh, <laughs> no, um, the connection is clear. I mean, the, the, the people say um, that ecology is really difficult. Somebody said that it's not rocket science, it's much harder. Um, this, I, I actually st specialize in studying the obvious. Uh, everything has to eat and you have to provide what what they eat. It, it really doesn't get any more simple than that. Okay, thank you. So 
Uh, let me say before I forget to do so that we have about 15 minutes for questions now, but Doug has generously agreed to come back next Sunday, May the 3rd, for the second Sundays in the Gardens with the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour. So from 10 o'clock till 1045, we'll have Doug with us again, and we'll be able to pick up with the questions that we can't get to today. But um, let's turn to Stephanie now. And Stephanie, do you have some questions that have come up that you'd like to um, ask Dr. Tallamy? Yes, some great questions here. And uh, one that's really hands-on, and I've had the same question is, um, Doug, what's a great time to actually find caterpillars in the yard? Like, would you have to sneak out in the middle of the night or where would you look? What time of day? Boy, that, that's a tough one for me on the East Coast. I can tell you a great time for, for our ecosystem. Uh, the best time would be end of July, uh, early August. Night is a very good time to look for caterpillars because a lot of them don't feed by day. They're hiding from the birds and they only come out at night. Uh, what you're trying to do is dodge the primary period when birds are breeding because they've already gotten a lot of those caterpillars. So if you look in the springtime, there are caterpillars there, but the birds are really good at finding them, much better than you are. So I would uh, wait till most of the birds have finished breeding and then then start to look. Uh, so whenever that is in the San Francisco area, that's that's when I would look. Great. Thank you, Doug. There, um, I really liked how you described the uh, caterpillars as like little sausages. And along the same lines, there was a question by somebody, well, what about snails and slugs and other kind of soft uh, possible food sources? Are those any value to birds? Some birds, uh, some birds, we always wonder where birds are getting all of their calcium. And, and there was a you know big flurry of research trying to see how many snails they ate. Uh, apparently not many. There's just not, not many uh, snail shells in their, in their feces. Uh, slugs, uh, you know, box turtles eat slugs. Most of the slugs we have, at least in the east, are introduced species from, from Europe. Uh, we don't see them represented in diets. The data I showed you about the uh, birds feeding their young came from a citizen science project that Ashley Kennedy conducted, uh, asking people from all over the country to send in pictures of birds bringing food to their to their young. And she had about 7,000 pictures. And a lot of the birds bringing in food had multiple prey items in their beak. I don't think we got one slug uh, in there. I'll have to check with her. Maybe we got one. But they're certainly not important components of the diet. It really is. Uh, it's spiders and caterpillars would be the two top ones, followed by orthopterans. So. Right. Um, a number of questions came in that were about kind of good and bad bugs. And you know, when you're you have a garden, you don't want to lose plants, you want to support the caterpillars and, and other bugs that are valuable to birds. Um, but how do you distinguish that? I'm, I'm just going to read from one of the questions. I'm not sure how to figure out which insects I'd want to be attracting because they are food sources for birds versus insects that I'd want to get rid of because they completely destroy a plant maybe. Uh, okay, complicated question. We don't want any insects from other countries. So we don't want gypsy moth or emerald ash borer or hemlock woolly adelgid, any of the introduced species that are, are wreaking havoc on our plants. And the reason they are is they're here without any of their natural enemies. Uh, so they're, you know, they're invasive species themselves and I'm not promoting them on any level. Uh, but to assume that because a caterpillar is eating your plant is gonna kill it is, um, it's just not so. Who was protecting our plants before we came here to, to start spraying them? Uh, nobody was. Everything was in balance. What you want to do is have enough natural enemies in your yard, which are those birds, it's the parasitoids and the diseases that keep the insect herbivores in check. So there's a long way between having a plant that has a few leaves and little holes eaten out of it and that plant actually dying from insect herbivory. Uh, it's rare that insects are, are actually killing plants in a balanced ecosystem. So we have to loosen up on what we consider to be uh, threats to our garden. Now, if you're talking about your vegetable garden, uh, that's a different story. There we're trying to raise food for ourselves. Uh, anything the caterpillars eat is, is uh, we're losing. And again, a lot of the, the uh, vegetable pests are introduced plants themselves. In the east here, we've got the cabbage white butterfly. Uh, which is a, a big problem in the in the garden, and it's introduced. So, so again, it's here without its natural enemies. So we're not talking about promoting those, but uh, we should we should tolerate a lot more uh, insect 
presence and you can call it damage if you want and the the plants that are in our yards the the ornamental plants and if you do that long enough the natural enemies will come and keep things in balance most of our plants are viewed at a distance so if you go and look at them close up you can see see a few holes uh, eaten here and there but at a distance you can't notice that at all stephanie can i pop in with a question so um, I love that you pointed out what we can do in our own yards to uh, improve the ecological value. And I'm wondering, how do you think we can convince water districts where here in California, they have their approved plant lists, which are almost all non-natives or park districts, like you had said in your talk, oh, you Californians love eucalyptus. Not everybody does, they're weeds, but our park district is, our local park district here is just, it's full of eucalyptus. So how can we convince uh, public officials, cities and counties with the properties that they control to do a better job of managing them. Were they listening today? <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I don't know why uh, the park district would promote these other plants. Uh, it seems to me that, well, we humans like trees, for one thing. So and there are an awful lot of Californians that are transplants from the east. They want to see the trees that were growing in the east, so they plant them. Uh, but that's not a good reason to try to, to change up ecosystems. Eucalyptus, it seems to me, is a tremendous fire, fire hazard. Uh, so yeah, the, you know, if you took them away, you would have more grassland than, than you have now, but um, they're not cost free. And I can't tell you why they're being promoted. This is why I write the books so that people will read them and try to get you know, this basic knowledge into the people who are actually managing landscapes. So water district managers ought to know these basics that all, most people think all plants are the same. You know, there's no difference between plants. So we'll just use the ones that are either cheap to get, that has something to do with it. Uh, grow quickly, that has something to do with it. Um, but, but ecosystem function has got to become a criterion in the future. And right now in most places it's not. Yeah, I, I know that a lot of street trees actually are chosen um, here in my city of San Leandro by what would actually survive the harsh conditions of how a street tree grows. So um, you natives, would you, uh, Doug, be able to comment on natives um, being hardy in a kind of very urban environment, not in the backyard, but maybe say as street trees? Are there fewer that would stand that? Sure. Uh, we have to find out what they are. We found, you know, there there are uh, a number of trees from China that are good at doing that. So all of a sudden, there's this urban legend that native plants can't survive in a city. You know, it has to be a plant from China. That's that's just plain crazy. We haven't looked very hard for the plants that are good at surviving in tough situations. But uh, you go into the mountains, looking in, in a rocky uh, crag where there's a, a tree growing out of a crack, that could survive on a street corner. Believe me, we. We have to come up with the genotypes that are good at challenged environments. So uh, a native plant is no different from any other plant. It's right plant, right place. We just have to find the right ones for the situations we're trying to, to plant in. Uh, and we have to look harder. There, I saw the number of species in California. You've got over 7,000 species of plants in California on CalScape there. Believe me to say that none of them will survive in a city. Don't buy it. I don't buy it. Another question here about finding native plants. Um, so we will in this program have highlight a few uh, native plant nurseries, but um, uh, mainstream nurseries also sell natives, but often they're hybrids. So we got a few questions yes. about hybrids, like say monkey flowers here in California, there are a lot of hybrids out there versus the, the native species. Right. By hybrid, uh, I think a lot of times you, there are hybrids out there, but you're probably talking about cultivars, which are genetic variants of particular species. And a lot of people, if it's a native plant, they'll call it a native var. Um, a lot of these cultivars are genetic variants that were found in nature. And then just, they were pretty, so they started to market them. They put a fancy name on them. Others were actively selected for. Uh, the question is, are they as good as the straight species? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on what the genetic trait was that was, was changed. We did a study back here where we looked at six common cultivar traits, uh, things like changing the leaf color from green to red or purple, making a plant shorter to make it more compact for a, a smaller area, introducing disease resistance, increasing fruit size, introducing leaf variegation, 
um, had six traits altogether. And the only trait that actually decreased insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because that's loading the leaf with anthocyanins uh, and that's a feeding deterrent. Um, so, uh, so it's not that all cultivars are automatically bad, but I would like to see the straight species offered uh, because we know that works. It should be an option for people to be able to, to buy it. If you go to your nursery and say, I, I want this plant and I want the straight, straight species. And he says, well, we don't carry that, then leave don't buy something else, eventually they'll get the message that that's something they should start start carrying. The other thing about cultivars that bothers me is that uh, most of them are propagated clonally. So there's zero genetic variability and we're putting you know, plants in the landscape with zero genetic variability. And in the, the days of climate change, that is not a good idea. It's never a good idea, but particularly now we want as much genetic variability as possible. So I'd love to see more straight species offered for sale. Have you had any luck on the East Coast, like getting large retailers to do a better job on um, labeling so it's really clear for us to pick the right plants? Some, some. Um, a, a lot of places, uh, they say it's voluntary or, or to stop selling the invasive plants is voluntary. And the, the nursery industry has said to us, don't make it voluntary because the guy who doesn't do it is the, is then the one that everybody goes to and buys the plants from. So you're punished if you voluntarily don't carry something. Uh, make it mandatory so that everybody has to do it. Everybody's on the same playing field. But a lot of nurseries back here are labeling their plants as, as native or not. It's a step forward. We've got a ways to go though. I mean, the big box stores, uh, some, some labeling, but not universally. And one interesting question, I hope I paraphrase this correctly kind of about um, critical mass of plants, like um, massing natives in your yard versus having individuals, even within your yard, not fragmenting. Um, do you have any best practices around that? Yeah, it's a real good question. Nobody's done any research on, on that. You could imagine that the, the bigger the mass of available plant, the bigger the signal it will send to things that eat that plant. Insects find their plants through chemistry, they smell them, uh, they fly to them, but they're really good at, at finding them. So you do want a diversity of plants in your yard, but having a, uh, a critical mass is also important. I, I tell a story because it's happened to me several times where I get an email from somebody that says, I planted a milkweed in my yard. So they've got one, one milkweed ramet. And I went out and looked and there were worms on it. So I squished them. The worms, of course, were monarch caterpillars, which would have defoliated that one ramet. You've got to have enough um, biomass so that at least one ovipositing female can, can uh, lay her eggs and have the larvae develop without wiping out your plants. Of course, that milkweed wasn't dead. It would come up from the roots uh, the next, next year or even that year, but it, it disturbs people to see the caterpillars doing what you bought the plant for. Um, so education's part of it, but uh, I would, I, for, for herbaceous things, I'd like to see um, a little bit more massing than single single plants. It's much more convenient for pollinators to not have to move uh, long distances between the plants they're looking for when they've got a bunch in one place. It's it's useful. So it's you know it's a judgment call. It depends on how much property you have, but um, try to get uh, massing and diversity at the same time. And good luck. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Um, a bunch of questions have come in that are very California specific and are actually about fire danger and kind of managing or, or finding the balance between that undergrowth that pr provides shelter for um, bugs and all of those good things, but don't increase the risk of fire. I know Doug, where you are, that's not really an issue. Um, I hope we have time to address that in a, at a different time on during uh, our series of tour of the tour. Uh, any comments, Doug, on that? I just posing it to you. Yeah, you're right. It's not an issue here at all. Um, but I have heard the question asked a number of times. I've read uh, some comments about how you can build a, a, a landscape that is less fire uh, susceptible. None of them seem very satisfactory to me. 
you, you know, when you get those big fires, those embers fly long distances and land on your roof. And it doesn't matter what the vegetation is around your, your house. Um, the biggest problem with our fires, of course, is has been historical fire management where we've we didn't do uh, fire management for a hundred years. Now we get these mega fires that um, are going to burn everything. So it's a serious issue, but having a barren landscape is probably not, not the answer. Um, eucalyptus is not the answer either uh, for, for fire problems. So um, I'd love to see somebody who's thought about this from the, the California Native Plant Society comment on that. Uh, and they do a much better job than I would. Quick clarification on what was said earlier on the recommended like 70% of natives in your yard. Uh, somebody would like to clarify if that's how, is that number of plants, is that? Um, it's biomass, biomass. And, and so how, uh, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> well, if, uh, let's say you've got a, a big, uh, one of your big oak trees in your yard, massive plant, but it's one, it's one. Okay, and let's say you had um, two dozen other species of non-natives. The biomass of that one oak tree is still a lot more plant material than your, your uh, two dozen perennial plants. Um, so the, you can you think of biomass as the weight, the weight of the, of the uh, vegetation. You want living parts of the plant. The amount of trunk that's there is not going to contribute much, but the amount of, of leaves. That's what we mean by biomass. I hope that helps. That does help. Um, a question about uh, feeding birds, like say a hummingbird feeder and seeds um, to support native plants in the landscape. Is that okay, great, or would you discourage that? No, I encourage it. I encourage it. Uh, and this goes against some of the recommendations from uh, ornithologists. I've heard them say birds don't need any help. They can find food for themselves. Uh, but I don't think those people have looked around. In a typical residential neighborhood, the, you know, most of the plants are non-native. They're not making good bird food and the birds can't, the food isn't there. So supplementing uh, food uh, during, now remember, the only, the best way to supplement is with seed. Nobody, we haven't figured out a good way to put out a lot of insects. People put out mealworms. That's a beetle with very few carotenoids. It's not a good substitute for, for caterpillars. So the best way to really feed the birds is with those caterpillars and the plants that, that make them. But after they've reproduced, a lot of plant birds do depend on seeds and berries. Uh, they need their carbohydrates. Certainly the hummingbirds need the, the feeders um, so done properly so that your, your feeders are clean. They're not, uh, you don't have any, any um, rancid seed. You don't want that. You don't want your feeders so close together that birds are going to spread diseases among them. If you do all that uh, in a standardized way, research has shown that the birds enter the breeding season heavier. They produce more eggs and they're actually healthier when it's done properly. So I do, I do promote it. Let's see here, what else do we have? Um, other panelists, feel free to jump in. I, I wanted to uh, talk about assessing biomass. So when I go out to look at a garden to see if it's a good fit for the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour, I uh, look at a plant bed or a certain area to the left of the driveway. And in my mind's eye, I color all the native plants green, for example, and I color all the non-native plants red. And I just, think, well, what am I seeing more in that bed? Is it more green or more red? I keep that in mind. I look on the other side of the driveway and I assess that patch. I look at the parking strip and then I average them. And that's just a, a quick way to um, assess what percent of native plants you have in your yard. So I want to say now that, um, let me see, I thought we had Nancy. Do we have Nancy yet? I don't think we do. We can go ahead and continue oh. taking some questions. Uh, for a little bit longer while we wait for our first garden tour host to join us. Okay, let me pose one more here, maybe just one. Um, so a few questions have come in about uh, fruit trees and planting natives, but also vegetable gardens like Victory Gardens are really big right now. Um, and I was thinking earlier when you were talking about the um, prunus species or, or genus that's really valuable for biodiversity. I mean, that's the 
native plum and the native cherry. So what about say a more common fruit tree, a cherry or a, a plum, any value there, supporting value or what would you say? No, there, there is, but it depends on how you treat it. Most people who are raising fruit for themselves end up spraying. It's hard to hard to raise fruit without diseases and things without a spray schedule. And then of course that knocks out all the insects. But growing food locally, growing our vegetable gardens and producing fruit on our properties, uh, that's another thing. I, I certainly support that because for a, for a number of reasons, it's apples and oranges. I'm, I am not, most of our, our edible plants are not natives themselves, but it doesn't mean we're gonna stop eating. We need those, those plants. So these are, this is what you're doing with the non-food plants in your yard typically the decorative plants that we have. Most people are not growing food in their yards. Most people don't garden at all. They simply hire somebody and they come in, they put in a cookie cutter, uh, classic landscape, the way all your neighbors have it because they want to fit in. But as a society, we're generally too busy to garden. We just hire somebody. And what I'd love to see is a missing industry right now where you can hire what I call an ecological landscaper to say, do it. You don't have to worry about it. And they know what they're doing. Well, we kind of have those here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So on the uh, Garden Tours website is a section, uh, there's a little line of pu puppies that runs down the left-hand side and about the third of the way down, I think says, find a designer. And those are designers who specialize in um, gardening with California native plants. In my experience, having seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gardens, uh, if you have a designer who does not specialize in California native plants, you are very unlikely to get a native plant garden. Um, people design with the plants that they're familiar with. And if it's not someone whose specialty that is, it's um, not likely that you'll wind up getting the native plant garden that you might want. So I'm gonna say now, uh, Doug, it was fantastic to have had you with us this morning. I wanna thank you. I really enjoyed hearing You're your welcome. presentation again. You're welcome. Thanks. And we are very lucky that Doug has agreed to join us next Sunday at 10 o'clock uh, to answer the questions that we couldn't get to today. So I hope that you will join us again next Sunday.